Um, I'm Andrea Sato with the Wilton Library, and I work on adult programs. So we're excited to have you here, and we welcome Jim Cameron. So I'd like to give you a little bit of information about Jim, and then I'll turn it over to him. So uh, Jim Cameron is a longtime commuter advocate and commentator on transportation issues in the state of Connecticut. He, in 1993, he joined the Connecticut Metro North Rail Commuter Council, where he served 11 years as vice chairman and four years as chairman. He later founded the Commuter Action Group to push for reforms on behalf of Metro North riders. Since 2003, he has authored a biweekly newspaper column and blog, Talking Transportation. Maybe you've read it which appears Mondays in four online news websites across Connecticut, including the Connecticut Mirror and Connecticut Examiner. Jim has lived in Darien for 30 years, where he serves as program director of the town's government TV station, Darien TV 79. He also serves on the Merritt Parkway Conservancy and Darien's representative town meeting but says he has no aspirations for higher office. The only thing I'm running for is the train, he says. So that makes sense. Let me just say as a final word, and then I'm logging off, or I'll, I'm getting off uh, to give over to Jim, but um, we're taking questions in the Q&A, but we're taking questions at the end. So if you want to put your question in along the way, feel free to do so, and Jim will try to answer them all when he's finished with his talk. So with that, I'm turning it over to Jim Cameron. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Can you see that okay? Oh, there we go. That's better. Great, okay. Uh, well, thank you all very much for uh, being here this evening. Uh, this is the, as I was telling Andrea, it's the uh, final uh, performance in what has been a five-month uh, run of this uh, particular talk. Uh, and I've been updating it as we go along uh, to try to customize it for each of the different audiences. So I've done that again as well this evening. Uh, so I'm Jim Cameron, and uh, I am an avowed columnist, not communist. Somebody thought I'd said an avowed communist, a columnist. And a columnist is different than my previous work as a journalist. Uh, in that my my column, which I write every week, is supposed to be commentary. And my role model in all of this is uh, Tom Friedman from the New York Times, who says he sees himself as either being in the heating business or the lighting business. And by that, he means lighting a fire underneath people's backsides, but supporting his opinions with facts. So they're not just opinions. And I try to do that in my column as well, too. Uh, anytime anybody doesn't agree with what I'm saying, um, I will always footnote my facts as well, too. So uh, we're going to have some fun tonight. Uh, we're going to, uh, first of all, share a secret with you about the Danbury branch, because I know that you people from Wilton are curious about why things are the way they are on that branch of Metro North. Then we're going to talk in, uh, briefly about why we're even talking about transportation where we were with all of this before COVID hit, what has happened since, how we are adapting on the train, on the bus, on the highways as well too, what I think are some potential dangers ahead, and then we will have time for Q&A, uh, which as we mentioned, you can just put in the chat. So as we go along, if if something sparks your curiosity, either uh, write it down or, or put it into the chat. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the Danbury branch was once electrified and ran with electric trains? Uh, if you would like the full story on this, drop me an email. I will send you a copy of my column, which I wrote on this a while back. Uh, it was until 1959 that uh, electrified trains ran on the Danbury branch. New Haven Railroad first electrified back in 1909. Uh, and the last electric train ran in 59 because of a stupid mistake that was made by uh, management of the railroad. Patrick McGinnis it was something of a scoundrel, was the uh, the president of Metro North. And because the trains had all been electric, they were able to run all the way from New York City and 
points west up as far as New Haven. But in New Haven, they had to change because there was no electrification between New Haven and Boston in the old days. So they had to get changed to diesel. And that meant wasting time and labor and having to have two kinds of equipment, diesel for the last part of the run, electric for the other part. So uh, McGinnis wanted to hybridize that, and he ordered the, the, uh, the, the, the Prius of its day, if you will, a dual-load locomotive called the FL9 that he thought was going to be cheaper than having all the electrics and the, the support of the catenary, the overhead wire, et cetera. And it would also mean no engine change in New Haven. So the train could run diesel from Boston in New Haven. It would just hook up to the overhead catenary. Uh, and then to the third rail in Westchester County and run electric. The problem was the FL9s did not run well. They only had half the power of the electric locomotives, and they were so uh, prone to freezing up in the winter that they had to run them all night long. <clears throat> Excuse me, diesel fuel was a little cheaper in those days, of course. Uh, but by the time that was decision or that fact was found about how badly they ran, the electrics were gone. They'd been scrapped. And in many places, the copper wire had been removed, such as on the Danbury branch. Uh, fast forward to the uh, the 2020s, and uh, now we're talking about maybe going back to hybrid rail cars again, not to necessarily re-electrify the Danbury branch, but to run diesel trains, uh, uh, trains that run diesel on the branch, and then can run electric uh, into uh, Grand Central. So... Little footnote to history, you uh, you know you had a a chance to stay electric all these years and then never had the the foresight, the management back then to do it. Why are we talking about transportation in the first place? I highly recommend uh, this book. It's called The King's Best Highway by Eric Jaffe, and I had a chance to interview him for uh, the town TV station uh, during COVID. Fascinating book. Uh, I, you know, I usually don't do book reports, except what was interesting about this is this book is all about the development of the Boston Post Road, how it came into being and what it meant. Back in the olden days, in the colonial days, if you wanted to go between New York and Boston by land, not by sea, it would take seven days. You would have to get on a horse and spend seven days and seven nights. There were no through roads. There were no highways, per se. You would go from Indian path to horse trail to open field and beyond. Uh, and in those days, if you wanted to get news from Boston to New York that the British were coming, communications meant transportation. You had to get there to share that particular piece of news. Uh, these days, you can make that distance even shorter, not by taking a cella, but by just using the technology we're using tonight, Zoom. And this technology, which was brought on as a bastard child of COVID, if you will, has changed our lives forever. We do not need to travel as much as we used to. Uh, you don't, the reasons that we used to give for going there, going from point A to point B, have certainly changed. Why commute if you can telecommute? Why go to a store if you can shop online? Or go to the movies if you can fire up Netflix? And the big question is, with this technology, and people are not going back to the office, what's going to happen if they don't come back in the numbers that the railroad used to depend on? This is the old office workplace. Maybe some of you had an office like this. Uh, in the past couple of years, it's looked more like this, or maybe like this. Uh, here's a dad who's got two laptops. One uh, needs to have its diaper changed, and the other is on the floor. Uh, waiting for his other child to come over and push the keys. Uh, working from home is uh, something that we had to do. Uh, and somehow we embraced, and many of us now want to do. So how is Metro North doing these days versus the past? Everything is measured in pre-COVID times. Uh, March of 2020, that was the demarcation point. They were uh, carrying 3.1 million riders a month very good on time performance and a lot of service in rush hour. There were two or three trains an hour, not on the branch line. Of course, we're talking about the main line here, <clears throat> but even off peak, there were two trains an hour on the main line. 
More recently, the on-time performance has been good. The reports I'm getting from most commuters is that they tend to run pretty close to on-time. On-time defined as arriving within five minutes and 59 seconds of the advertised timetable. However, the ridership has not come back. The ridership has flatlined at about 70%. The peak days of ridership are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, there are more riders on the weekends in terms of actual number of riders than there are Monday and Friday. Monday and Friday, you could fire a cannon off in your local parking lot at the train station, and no one would get injured. Pre-COVID, it was standing room only at rush hour. Some of these people were paying 400, 450 bucks a month for the privilege of standing for an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters each way to and from their jobs in New York City. COVID comes, not so crowded, lots of room to spread out. And that was important when social distancing may mean that you weren't going to get the COVID, but also meant that Grand Central looked eerily silent as if, uh, you know, a neutron bomb had gone off. Here's my best barometer of how ridership is going. Go to look at your local train station parking lot. This is the Fairfield lot in 2010. This is my lot at Naroden Heights in 2021. Now, that lot is the daily parking lot, not the permit lot. That lot has filled up again. Even the permit lot has started to fill up again, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But three days do not a railroad make. Pre-COVID, here's the Danbury train. You probably recognize it, that platform way over on the east side. And that's what it looked like when that whole train disgorged at Grand Central. Uh, Post-COVID, it's a little uh, not, not quite so crowded. <clears throat> and a lot more masks. Masks were important. And Metro North had to teach people how to wear masks. Frightening that people did not know that both their mouth and their nose had to be covered. And that was not just because the railroad was asking you to do that. It's because the Transportation Security Administration, the Safety Administration, I guess is more accurate, the TSA, made that a federal mandate on all interstate transportation, buses, trains, airplanes. The problem was that it was not enforced. As this uh, picture by a commuter shows, the conductor wasn't even wearing it properly. And uh, these bros hanging around in the vestibule on the way home, their masks are gone and the six packs are open. Have a beer, gentlemen. I got no problem with that. But if you're not wearing masks and you're not enforcing mask wearing, what good is that rule? Uh, the TSA's rule was left in a compliance com component by Metro North to its own MTA police department. <clears throat> and have, can you can you remember the last time you ever saw an MTA cop on a train in Connecticut? Uh, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've seen that in the last 20 years. Uh, they're non-existent up here. So why leave enforcement to a non-existent police department? Uh, they did pass out, to their credit, thousands of masks a day. Conductors were handing them out left and right. They had the little Metro Man robot handing them out as well, too. But no one was telling people they had to wear them. Even though there was a $50 fine, it was 100 bucks in Connecticut for non-compliance, in July of 2021, we did a Freedom of Information Act request. And we found out from Metro North MTA police that they had not issued a single ticket in a year in Connecticut. Uh, that just does not breed anything but contempt for the law and the rules. Uh, the TSA rule went away in April of this past year, of this year, uh, by order of the courts. Uh, the movie Jerry Maguire. Do you remember this? Show me the money. Uh, you know, it's all I think our future is coming down to where the money is and where the money is going to come from. The MTA, the parent of Metro North, the Long Island Railroad, the subways and the buses, admits that they are facing a fiscal cliff, that the $15 billion that they received from the federal government to keep operations during COVID is not going to last. McKinsey, the consultant that they have paid a million dollars plus to, to tell them what they wanted to hear, which was, when is ridership going to come back after COVID goes away? We're promised that by the middle of this decade, ridership would be back to 80, maybe 92%. Uh, that did not happen. 
Uh, they are also losing, this did not require McKinsey to tell them this, the MTA is losing a half billion dollars per year due to fare evasion, people jumping the turnstile. Now, the problem that they have identified is that the federal bailout money is going to run out before 2024, which is when they were hoping that they would be able to cap out their capital improvements, including subway signals and buses and new cars and ADA access. And the congestion pricing would go into effect, the, the tolling plan for Midtown Manhattan. Uh, that is still stuck. That is not moving forward. And even if it is approved, that money cannot be used for operating subsidies and expenses. It can only be used for capital expenditures. So what's the answer to all of this? There are really only three variable costs that the MTA has control over. The first is labor. And quite wisely, they announced early on they were not going to have layoffs. Amtrak laid off a bunch of people, and now they're scrambling, trying to get back. They have not been able to get the, the, the technical help they need. They have not been able to get cars out of the shop. They don't have enough locomotive engineers or conductors or cafe car attendants. Amtrak is hurting because they laid everybody off. To their credit, MTA said, no, we're going to keep employees on. And But at some point, even though they are getting less work than they used to and reducing their paychecks going home, in some cases by 40%, because uh, they're not getting the overtime they used to get. There are no, still no plans cut, or sorry, no, no cuts planned, sorry, by uh, MTA in terms of labor. The other two things they have somewhat control over are schedules. Should they continue running a lot of trains uh, at the schedules that they're doing? Uh, not if they can't afford to run the ones that they have now, but would reduced service just discourage further ridership? Fares are the one thing that they're really getting serious about talking about now in terms of increasing. Um, the MTA is murmuring about a fare increase on the subways to over $3, about 5.5%. Uh, if there's a fare increase on the subways and the buses, there will be a fare increase on the commuter rail. Now, the fares that are set by Metro North are not necessarily the same as those that are set by the DOT in Connecticut. DOT in Connecticut controls New York fares, but they have always been in lockstep. One raises it, the other one does as well, too. But again, if you raise the fares, are you going to discourage ridership and then enter what they refer to as the death spiral, where reduced ridership adds to further cuts in service that reduces ridership uh, as well, too. Even pre-COVID, what you paid for your ticket did not cover the actual cost of the ride. Every trip was, and still is, even more so now, subsidized. On the main line of Metro North, every ticket that is purchased, whatever the cost, whatever the destination, is subsidized to the tune of $3.25. On the Danbury branch, $17 per ticket per ride is subsidy. But you're not you're 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 way at the head of the list compared to the other branches. Waterbury branch, almost $25. Shoreline East between New Haven and uh, New London, almost $50 a ticket. And the winner of the most heavily subsidized per passenger per trip ride on mass transit in this state is the Hartford line that runs between New Hartford, excuse me, New Haven, Hartford, and Springfield. Uh, beautiful line. Nice uh, new equipment coming as well, too. Beautiful stations, but not the ridership to cover the costs anywhere near. Now, if ridership is only 70% of what it was before when these numbers were in effect, how do you do the math? I'm not a finance guy, but I know that all these numbers are much higher given that the ridership is not coming back strong. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what I refer to as unsustainable. So back in December of 2020, two years ago now, I predicted rail commuters would not all be coming back. Metro North, let's just say I did not get a Christmas card from Metro North that year. They were really 
pissed that I would make that prediction. Uh, and I don't want to say, I told you so, or I knew I, 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 it was just obvious to me. Because people had discovered during COVID that they did not need to go to work to be able to get their work done. And in many cases, bosses were permanently closing offices, entire floors in skyscrapers to save money. In many cases, moving to satellite offices in the suburbs so that they could get people face to face but not ask them to get on a train and waste three hours a day getting to and from their jobs. The problem is that fewer commuters means higher deficits, and who's going to end up paying the bill? Well, let me get back to this one. It ain't going to be the federal government anymore. There is no appetite, especially under a Republican-controlled Congress starting in January, there is no appetite to pump more money into blue states in the Northeast to subsidize mass transit. So what does this leave for Metro North to do? And the other question that I think has greater impact here in Connecticut is, what's going to happen to transit-oriented development, TOD, when transit is less necessary? Will the development become less necessary along with the transit? And you have no farther to look than my backyard in Darien to the, to the complex that's being built at the Neroden Heights train station. Look at it next time you come by on the train. It's called Darien Commons. Uh, it's a mixed-use development. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the, the, at the bottom of each of these buildings over here are a collection of restaurants and shops and colonnades and spas, and upstairs are the apartments. 112 apartment units at New York City prices. Studio starting at $1,600 and a, a handful of three bedrooms that start at $5,500 a month. That's not affordable housing, <laughs> even by Darien standards. Those are Stanford prices or New York City prices. But they've done a beautiful job architecturally with this, uh, partly because planning and zoning held their feet to the fire and said, you're not going to put up some monolithic slab. Uh, make it look pretty. And they have. And I mean, look at this. This is, you know, the, the tenants only private deck. And there's probably a jacuzzi in the back and maybe kombucha on tap. I don't know. Uh, but are people going to live there uh, if they don't have to walk across the street to the train station? Why don't they live in Manhattan? Uh, they're not taking the train every day. Uh, do they want to be living there? They could probably rent a house for that same kind of price, uh, even in parts of Darien, uh, starter house at least. Uh, so the, the impact of the change in our commutation patterns is profound. And it's not just on Metro North, it's on the very development of our communities as well too. How do you get riders back on the train? I asked this question on Facebook and Twitter. And the first thing everybody told me was faster service, please. One commuter who took a train in 2004 said his 50-minute commute now takes an hour and 10 minutes. I think that's probably from maybe from Greenwich. Uh, there are too many stops, uh, and everybody has been saying, why not add some zoned expresses? Have a, have a train start in New Haven, run express to Bridgeport, maybe stop in Stanford, and then continue on. There's three of those now at about 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's great. If you're catching a five o'clock train out of downtown New Haven, God bless you. I don't know what kind of work you're doing in Midtown. Uh, but more of that zoned kind of service. There's no reason that the train that you get on in Bridgeport has to make every single local stop to Stanford. Uh, somebody suggested reserved seating or Wi-Fi. There is no Wi-Fi on Metro North. There may be in the future because your tax dollars uh, are going to pony up 23 million of their fellow tax dollars to be given to Metro North by the state to put Wi-Fi in our trains, something that Metro North would not do on its own, even with the cooperation of uh, Altice and Optimum and Comcast, etc. cetera. Uh, bar cars. Don't get me started on the bar cars. If I had a buck for every time somebody said, whatever happened to the bar cars, I'd be uh, buying a bar car. Uh, the bar cars are not coming back. Trust me, they're an anachronism. Lower fares. Now, you know, if you're not buying a monthly ticket, why would you buy, you know, a 10 trip? 
maybe you can still get a discount, but with a 20 trip, that's what they decided to do. So they've, they've, they've incentivized people for buying more tickets in advance. The problem is that nobody's buying a monthly ticket anymore. The monthly tickets, the all you could eat 30 day commutation pass used to represent 47% of all the fare revenue in Metro North. It's now, I believe, excuse me, it's still in the single digits. So uh, they got to do something with ticketing. Somebody also suggested, why not save some money on labor by not having conductors be glorified ticket takers? Have ticket inspectors and an honor system where everybody knows they get on that train, they got to have a ticket. And they'll have a random inspection coming around from time to time. And if you're caught without a ticket on that train, you can't buy one on the train. If you're caught without a ticket on the train, uh, you're going to get a $50 or $100 ticket. Uh, and I don't mean a one-way pass to Grand Central. I mean a fine. Um, that's a suggestion. I'm not sure the unions would go along with that. The other suggestion people had was, hey, here's a way to, here's a winning idea. Why not open the waiting rooms in the winter and provide some heat and some shelter? Uh, believe it or not, th that that's just happening now in Darien. And I wonder who suggested that to the first select woman. I don't know. Um, beyond, you know, actually having shelter in the winter, how about in the summer? How about doing some things to make the train stations look a little more attractive and less uh, utilitarian? That's where I, I, that's me, I donated some money to our local beautification commission, and they did some plantings around the, the Roden Heights train station. You're welcome. Uh, a little greenery, make it look, make it look cheerful. What's the impression that people get when they come up from the city and get off at your train station and they look at that train station? What's the first impression they get of your town? Why doesn't the real estate community pony up some bucks and make that train station look beautiful? So those people coming up from New York for a, looking for a place to live will say, yeah, this is the town I want to live in. They're really proud of how they look. So much for the trains. Let's get out on the highways before we get run over here. Highway traffic, boy, it returned to pre-COVID levels fast and furious. Uh, but the gasoline tax revenues that subsidize mass transit and highway repairs are down, way down, because the gas tax holiday has been in effect since April. And it's going to be in effect again until April of next year. But with the gas tax holiday, uh, and remember, federal infrastructure money, all that Biden buyback better money, that can't be spent on um, operating subsidies any more than the toll money that uh, congestion pricing will be able to generate in New York City. But one silver lining of the, of the gas tax holiday was, um, and I'll get to this in a second, it came with a free bus fare system as well, too. And we're going to talk about that in a second. The problem is that people are out driving around on the highway as if there's no tomorrow. And for 20,000 people who died in the first six months of this year, there was no tomorrow. The deaths on the highways are reaching extraordinary proportions. Speed zone cameras are coming in some areas of construction, but we still have an open container law in this state. We st it's still legal to drive around with an open can of beer sitting next to the to the driver or the passenger in a car what message does this send so let me introduce you to my new bff out on the highways his name is sean mansfield he's a state trooper i had a chance to do a drive along with sean mansfield uh to do a story about what his work is like as a state trooper so i met him up at troop t uh, in Bridgeport, and uh, uh, we got into his unmarked uh, Dodge Charger with uh, police lights, and uh, we set on down the highway. Oh, but before we got into the car, he showed me his gear. He's got a computer in there, and he's got he can he's got license plate readers. He's got radios. He can he can tell you what your SAT scores were the second time you took the test in about five minutes with just your license plate number and your driver's license. Amazing technology. The problem is it occupies a fair amount of the passenger seat. So uh, when I had to squeeze into the passenger seat, 
I had to uh, uh, allow for the fact that the first thing they did when I arrived at the police headquarters was they put me into a bulletproof vest. Didn't send the most you know, warming sense of confidence through my blood, whatever was still flowing uh, as I was wearing this thing. Like, why am I wearing a bulletproof vest? Where are we going? Uh, we're not doing SWAT calls, right? No. We drove around a little bit and, uh, you know, we wrote some tickets. Uh, he was, you know, we, I think we gave a ticket to some guy from Texas talking on his cell phone. Uh, welcome to Connecticut, sir. Um, but one one funny story about the speeding on the highways. We were driving back up toward Bridgeport after the rush hour and the traffic was finally moving. And we were in the middle lane. He was saying, I'm going to sit here in the middle lane and uh, go with the flow of the traffic and see if somebody blows my doors off on the left-hand side. You know, somebody passing me at 110 miles an hour, as people are doing on the highways these days. And uh, I said, he's, you know, he kind of had this glimmer in his eye about looking to pull somebody over doing that. I said, well, just let me know so I can tighten my seatbelt when, when, when you start to activate the lights. But I pointed out to him that we were driving along I-95 and Everybody, all of us were driving at about 70 miles an hour. We were all driving faster than the speed limit. And I said, you know, it's easy pickings for you. How do you decide who you're going to pull over and write a ticket to? And I had my pen out and my notebook was poised. And he said, just speaking for myself and not for the department, um, uh, I look for somebody who's going to be causing an accident, somebody who's weaving in and out of the lanes makes perfect sense uh but he basically told me it's okay to drive above the speed limit as long as you're not doing it in a crazy fashion you know sometimes when the traffic is moving on 995 if you're trying to drive 55 you're going to be in more trouble than if you were moving along at faster speeds uh bus ridership bus ridership only went down slightly when covid hit because the people who take the bus are different than the people that take the trains. In many cases, they don't own a car. They cannot telecommute. If you are a car mechanic or you are a nurse, you can't phone it in on Zoom. you got to show up and actually do the work. There are also people who make less money, and that's why this gas tax holiday means a lot to them. Even though it's not costing the state a whole lot of money, to subsidize those fares. I think it's 2.7 million a, a month for the whole state. That's a rounding error at DOT these days. Uh, 4 million a month, I think is an old number. I think the number is 2.7 from what I saw more recently. So it's not as expensive as I was even telling people. The question is how long will these fares continue? Uh, after April, 2023, they're supposed to you know, go away along with a phase out of the gasoline tax holiday. The uh, city council in New Haven and Hartford are both asking for the free fares to continue in their cities. Stay tuned. We'll see if that happens. But here's Greater Bridgeport Transit, which you can see on the far left is way back in 2001. Uh, and on the far right, the number in the, in the green bar graph there is finally exceeded the pre-COVID uh, best numbers that they had. Now, you know, again, it may be because the ridership, uh, the, the fares are free. So what's the long-term answer? I mean, if if we're going to try to contain uh, pandemic-like diseases like COVID, uh, if we're trying to encourage people to use mass transit and get out of their cars uh, and not kill themselves on the highway, how are we going to keep the, the, the fares affordable, the service up? Where's the money going to come from? Going back to Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Uh, well, the last guy that had a question like that was Dan Malloy when he was our governor in 2016. My God, it's already been six years now, almost seven years. Uh, the governor came out with his Let's Go CT plan. He wanted to be the transportation governor. And boy, he came out with a plan that made Biden blush. It had something for everyone. We were going to have everything except a maglev down the middle of I-95. There was stuff for the quiet corner. He was going to, uh, you know, 
power up the Danbury branch. It was, it was everybody in the state was going to get some transportation funding. The question was, where is the money going to come from? That's always the question. But, you know, he wanted his fingerprints on the success side of things. I'm the transportation governor. Here are the things I've suggested. But he did not want his fingerprints on the funding mechanism. So as they always do in Hartford, when they don't want to make a decision or they want to blame somebody else for what the decision has to be, they formed a blue ribbon panel. Yes, this was the Governor Malloy's transportation finance panel. And they studied and they suggested and they looked at every funding mechanism under the sun. They had experts come in from around the country. They talked about every solution under the sun. And they said, OK, here's how you're going to pay for all of this, Governor. And it's not one of these things. It's all of these things. The first thing was you got to put a lockbox on that special transportation fund. You know, that that fund where all the money from the gasoline tax goes, you, you can't keep dipping into that, Governor. You got to stop the legislature from treating it like a petty cash box. And that was done with a referendum that passed by, I think, 82 percent margin in the year 2018. There's a there's a box on that thing that's uh, it, it's unbreakable. Um, however, that wasn't enough. They also said, let's raise the gasoline tax a little bit, because in 1997, the legislature, in a very popular but stupid move, cut the gasoline tax 14 cents a gallon. That lost us billions of dollars in money that would have built buses and trains and bridges for the last seven years when this was proposed. Uh, so they said, look, you got to get the gasoline tax back up there. Uh, just raise it a little bit for the next seven years. We'll get the 14 cents back. No one will notice. Raise the gross proceeds tax on other petroleum products as well, too. Heating oil, propane, etc. They also suggested and was shot down immediately by both the Democrats and the Republicans, a vehicle miles tax. This is in use in Oregon and California and in Europe, where you go to the, the, the DMV once every two years to get your uh, emissions check, and they look at your odometer and they'll say, OK, Mr. Smith, in the last uh, two years, you drove 10,000 miles. Here's a bill. Miss Jones, I see you only drove 1,000 miles. Because you uh, you telecommute and you take the bus to work and you ride a bicycle. So here's a bill to you. The more you drive, the more you pay. It's like a gasoline tax. But it would also hit electric vehicles as well, too. Right now, you drive a Tesla, you ain't paying a dime to maintain our highways or subsidize mass transit because you're not buying gasoline. And yes, they also suggested the T word, tolls. And depending on who you talk to, it could bring in anywhere from three quarters of a billion to more than a billion dollars of a year a year in revenue. Depending on whether you tax out of staters at a different rate than in-state people, you give discounts through easy pass to uh, regular commuters. Uh, there's all kinds of options that, that that could be done. However, after fighting that battle for a year and a half, Governor Lamont said, nope, I guess tolls are not on the horizon. Uh, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to do a truck tax. And they put that truck tax into effect. It remains to be seen if it's going to be declared constitutional because a similar trucks only toll that was instituted in Rhode Island apparently was shot down by the courts. But I argue this question. I ask this question as this cartoon suggests. Aren't we paying tolls already? The sign says Connecticut tolls in effect. Blown tire, $200. Bent rim, $399. Damage suspension up to $2,000. We are paying for the neglect of our highways, except we're paying it to minus muffler instead of paying to have our highways be properly maintained. No more Miami River bridges, please. So those are my formal comments. I invite you, if you have questions, to email me, uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, visit the website, uh, sign up for my weekly newsletter. Uh, CT Mirror sends it out uh, by email each, uh, each Monday as well, too. And with that, let's see if there are any questions.
Jim, there aren't any questions in the Q and A. If I you have you a had, question, by yeah, all means, uh, see if there's a question. Okay, that there's like one. Good. Um, I'll read it to you. Please. I've been impressed with the public transit in Denver. While my experience is limited, I get off the plane, get on a bus, takes me to where I want to go. This is also true in San Francisco. Are there things we can learn from other states connecting buses, trains, and planes? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, you know, you can now actually, when you get to Denver International Airport, which is way outside of town, there's a light rail system you can take that'll take you downtown. Uh, or you can take a bus if you want to as well, too. San Francisco, you can walk off the airplane at, uh, I actually did this once. I went coast to coast without getting into a taxi cab uh, or a bus. I went from Stanford to Newark Airport on Amtrak. I got on the monorail at Newark Airport, got to the airport, flew to San Francisco. You step off the plane at San Francisco International Airport. You can walk onto a BART train, which uh, you know makes the Washington Metro look like the IRT in New York, and you'd be whisked downtown in just a matter of minutes. Uh, Cleveland. Cleveland has had a subway that goes out to its airport since the 1940s, maybe, or maybe the 50s. Yeah, well, you know, the, what they're trying to do at LaGuardia in terms of running uh, a subway spur up there uh, is too little too late. Robert Moses should have, you know, you know, Robert Moses would be rotating in his grave to hear this, but, you know, he was such a huge highways fan. He did everything he could to stop mass transit from being used because he believed in the highways. We, we could have had, um, you know, rail service directly to LaGuardia, uh, and to Kennedy airport as well. But, um, uh, it's hard to, to retrofit those sort of things on uh, an already developed city uh, a plan like New York City has right now. Other questions? What have you always wanted to know? Any questions about Metro North? Questions about Darien and dining? I have a question. Yes, May please. I? Um, so what is the, what do you think is the long-term viability of trains like Amtrak or even Metro North? You know, if you're talking about all these subsidies are so significant, I mean, it just doesn't, it can't last forever, I would think. Yeah. Jim, uh, put your question in the chat uh, box there. Cause we're, it's, we're in a webinar format. Uh, Amtrak is going, I, I think Amtrak, this will be a column I'm going to do soon. Amtrak deserves competition. There is no reason that Amtrak should be the only railroad that runs on the tracks in the Northeast Corridor, aside from the fact that they own them. Um, I like the Italian model, where the state, the government, in effect, owns the tracks, and private enterprise is allowed to come in and offer competing service at different fares to run on those tracks. If Amtrak had competition, and there are some private interests out there that are trying to make this happen, I think we would get lower fares and better service. Uh, I think Amtrak is hamstrung by its quasi-governmental uh, nature. Uh, and it just it's so slow to do anything that's innovative or marketing or encouraging of ridership. Good model to look at. In South Florida, there's a private railroad called Brightline that runs, um, it's kind of like a super commuter service from West Palm down to Miami, soon to be expanded to Orlando and then hopefully as far as Tampa. Uh, they're running Acela-like trains. Um, they've even dealt with the last mile situation. They will pick you up at your home and take you to the train station. And when you arrive at your destination station, they will take you from there to where you want to go. Family, friends, hospital, shopping, whatever it is. They've got jitneys. They've got, uh, you know, elaborate golf carts if you're close to the train station. Uh, 
Metro North is a whole other ball of wax. Um, but I maintain that we will have to have something like Metro North operating to um, keep this state afloat. Even if you're not taking the train five days a week like you used to, you need to know that that train is there. So that if you have a client meeting or somebody says, come on in, uh, I'll meet you for drinks at Grand Central, you can get there on short notice. If Metro North is not reliable, forget about affordable right now. If it's not reliable, if it doesn't offer the frequency of service, people will not want to live here. And if people don't want to live here, they won't be paying taxes here. And 40% of all the taxes paid in this state to the state government come from Fairfield County because people can live here and work at those expensive or well-paying jobs in New York City. So some kind of Metro North service must be maintained. And I think the state will find ways of subsidizing that. In addition to asking the people who take the train itself to pay more of the actual cost of their ride. Long answer to a complex issue. Folks, okay. I often say, you know, if there were easy answers to these things, yes. they would have been solved by now. And I'm just offering one guy's opinion. You may have your ideas as well, too. We have a few more questions. Too. Brilliant. We've we've pumped, we've, we've primed the pump. Go ahead. Okay. What can be done to improve the Danbury branch? Will double tracking the line up to Danbury, along with elect electrification, result in better service? This could cost up to $1 billion, and would taxpayers be willing to fund this project? Uh, I, I don't think you're going to see double tracking on uh, on the Danbury branch. I don't think it's necessary if there are enough passing sidings. Uh, what you're going to see is not electrification again either. At the top of my talk, if, if you missed it, there was the story about how the Danbury branch used to be electrified. What is proposed now, and I think is probably makes sense, is a dual powered system so that uh, a, a train can run diesel on the branch itself. And when it gets to, what is it, South Norwalk, uh, it could then pick up the electric uh, overhead catenary and run electric from there. Um, that's what the FL9 locomotives were designed to do. And I think that the replacement cars make, it makes more sense to do hybrid rail cars than to pay for stringing the wire. And I don't think you need to double track it you to in, to be able to improve the frequency of of service to at least once an hour uh i think if you got it down to every you know maybe twice an hour in rush hour people would be thrilled okay uh, another question speak about the new smaller airports that are expanding new haven etc uh it's very interesting. I went up to New Haven, um, very small airport. I never really looked at it until Avello, which is a new startup airline, started flying out of there. Uh, is it Avello? I think it's Avello. They have, there's another airline called Breeze that is uh, flying out of Westchester Airport and Bradley as well, too. But New Haven Airport, I'm now I'm I'm confusing myself. Bridgeport Airport and New Haven Airport uh, are both hosting low-cost carriers, startup carriers. Uh, New Haven Airport is running 737s, and uh, Sikorsky Airport in Bridgeport, I think, is running A220s. But they're nice planes. They're, they're not exactly luxurious seating, but what do you expect for $19 to go to Florida, okay? Uh, They'll, they'll cram you in there. Uh, there are no amenities per se. I mean, I don't think this, there might be Wi-Fi, but there's no seat backs, no uh, seat back videos, no uh, maybe bag of peanuts and pretzels, but sort of like bring your own. They're having a profound effect because they're really, uh, A, opening up a whole new market for uh, low cost travel in this state without having to go all the way up to Bradley Airport and fly Southwest 
uh, Southwest Airlines, uh, or you know, go to TF Green Airport in Providence, uh, or go down to the Newark Airport and you know, add a four hours to your journey. Uh, we'll see how sustainable they are um, if they can keep the fares low. They're they're fighting a big battle now in New Haven with the local uh, neighbors who are complaining about the, the noise of living near an airport, to which I say, you chose to live near an airport. What did you expect? You know, you can't live next to I-95 and say, but the trucks, there's so many trucks. Uh, now, yeah, I mean, the planes are bigger and there's more of them than there used to be, but those, uh, those real estate values are not gonna go down because of that airport and its new service, they're going to go up because people are going to want to live there because in many cases, they're working there. And if they're working at the airport, uh, whether you're a flight crew or you're a mechanic, makes much more sense to live in the neighborhood, doesn't it? And what about the industrial growth that could happen there as well, too? So here again, I mean, transportation used to mean communications. We don't need that now. But what transportation does mean is logistics and jobs and development. And if we think of investments in transportation in those ways, and not just getting from point A to point B when I want to go there, um, I think it's going to have much more economic impact on the state to recognize that the importance of that investment. End of speech. Okay, one more. Sure. This, Bring it on. This is hypothetical, but could a Metro North M8 train yeah. run to Boston? Would there be economies from combining Northeast Carter commuter service? God, I love these questions. That's a great question. Uh, it's not that hypothetical. Uh, I mean, physically, uh, logistically, physically, Yes, it could. It would. I believe it has the proper power conversion technology. Uh, it can all M8 cars can all M8. Okay, M8 cars are the the red lined cars that you see on the main line that have the overhead electrical systems. Uh, they run into Grand Central from New Haven. In recent months, they also run now on the new on the uh, Shoreline East Railroad from New Haven up to New London same overhead catenaries. There's one bridge where they have a problem with the third rail shoe, but that's small potatoes right now in, in your hypothetical example. So yeah, they could run as far as Boston. I don't think they need to. I think they need to run farther than they are now, which is just New London, and it's not all the shoreline East trains that go there. There's no reason that those trains could not also run to Stonington, to Mystic, and those points beyond New London and get up to cross the border into Rhode Island because the MBTA, their commuter railroad, comes down from Boston, past Providence, past the airport, and goes down as far, I think, as Warwick. There's no reason the Metro North and the MBTA could not meet in Warwick or one of those communities. The same way, if you want to go to um, Philadelphia, you don't have to take Amtrak and pay through the nose. You can take Jersey Transit to Trenton and switch at Trenton to SEPTA and take their commuter train to Philadelphia. This is the last section of the Northeast Corridor, all the way from Washington to Boston, that does not have commuter service redundant to what, Metro Nor uh, what Amtrak offers. Amtrak trains stop in Mystic I think it's just twice a day, twice a day. The, you know, if I was the Mystic Aquarium or uh, the the Indian casinos there, I'd be going, "Hey, I'm going to throw myself in front of the train. Stop the train. Let people get off." Uh, if if Metro North made that journey, it it could could answer that that particular question as well too. And there are some suggestions that that might happen. However. The problem is that Shoreline East ridership, as you saw from the chart, is subsidized already pre-COVID, 50 bucks a ticket, and their ridership has not come back anywhere near strong enough. 
they don't even have the schedules they used to pre-COVID, and they're having a hard time arguing they need to get back to more service, let alone expand it up into Rhode Island. So I, I like the hypothetical, you know, dream big, but uh, I'm I'm also kind of, you know, I'm trying to be realistic here. I, I'm a real advocate, okay? People go, why are you so negative, Jim? You're like Lewis Black. You're just, everything's... Rah, 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 rah. Now, maybe I'm getting a little cranky in my old age, but I, I think it's important that we be realistic about the decisions that have to be made and where the funding is going to come from. Anybody can dream up a maglev down the middle of I-95, but who's going to pay for it? And can we ask upstate people to keep subsidizing our rail fares? Yeah, you know, I mean, we subsidize their football stadium in East Hartford. We don't get to play up there. We are part of a larger thing called a state. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to speak truth to power. And we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Are there any other questions? Okay. There was one statement and another one other question. So the statement was just, I think it said Wickford Junction. Yes, Wickford Junction. The, Thank you very much. Where the community line ends in Rhode Island. Thank you. See, I told um, you, I warned you, Andrea, that the people who know more about railroading than me <laughs> would be here tonight to keep me honest. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, there's one more question, though. Does the freight line ownership of the Danbury line hurt commuter improvements? I freight line ownership. Freight line. I don't know that that line is actually owned by a freight railroad. I thought it was owned. Well, I think it's owned by DOT. Uh, now there are. I don't know if there are even freights that run on that branch. But I may be wrong. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm telling you more than I already know about all this stuff. So I don't know. I will say this, because uh, I often get a question, how come there are not more freight trains in Connecticut? Uh, there are a lot of freight lines in Connecticut, but they're all what are called short lines. Uh, they literally are very short, and they move a few boxcars from here to there. The New Haven Railroad used to run a very robust and very profitable full freight service on the main line. They had more freight trains, I think, than, than passenger trains at their peak. Uh, and they made a lot of money on it. Pre-interstate highways, pre-trucking. Uh, when that all went away, so did uh, you know most of their, their profits. And that's why they, uh, they went belly up in, in part as well, too. The problem we have with freight uh, is that the bridges are too low and the catenary, the overhead power line, uh, is uh, too low as well, too, to run the kind of double stack containers that you see in 99% of the rest of the country out west. Um, Metro North, which, you know, doesn't want to have a whole bunch of freights running on the main line because they run slower than the, the real train, the, their trains do. Um, it, the DOT owns that trackage from New Rochelle up to New Haven. Um, and I don't think they want to have a whole lot of freight running there either, especially if it slows up the already too slow trains on, on Metro North. So I'm not really sanguine about freight coming back. However, living fairly close, I live about a half mile at most from the main line of Metro North near Neroden Heights. I hear a freight train every night, a long, heavy freight train, usually the gravel train. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it sounds like it's running at 50, 60 cars. Uh, it ain't going fast, but uh, it's heavy and it's moving, and they do it late at night when it's not going to disrupt other service. Is there a final question, or have we achieved oh, lift I, ha I have another one. <laughs> oh, no, there is another one. Okay. I won't. I'll read the other one. Uh, instead of mine. Um, Connecticut transit hearings regarding New London and Norwich next week, Eastern Connecticut Rail. There is, uh, there is discussion in the eastern part of the state uh, about reinvigorating a former track right of way between those communities that were mentioned. 
if you are interested in and you live in that part of the state, uh, I would definitely uh, check out ctexaminer.com, which is the other electronic newspaper I write for that's based in the eastern part of the state. And they're really up to speed on on those tracks. I'm not conversant with that line or its chances of rejuvenation. But again, I would say, you know, with all of these, you know, ideas about bringing back rail service where it used to exist, we can't pay for the rail service we have now, let alone maybe come up with the money uh, to start new rail service that may or may not be successful. Jim Rose has his hand up again. Jim, put it in the chat box, see if we can help you out there. Is there another question or do you have one more? While he's doing that, uh, your mention of these small airports reminded me that I was curious if you had anything to say about the Greenwich uh, White Plains Airport. You know, it's it's such a great local airport, but it's so crowded. It's very crowded and it's never going to expand uh, because it is hemmed in on one side by uh, what I refer to as the Greenwich Swells, large estates just across the border. They're quite concerned with the noise of the airport, with the, sorry, bad impersonation of a Greenwich resident. Uh, they've had noise problems there for the, I mean, I, I grew up in Westchester County, so I remember picking my dad up at that airport on Mohawk Airlines when he would come up from Washington. They've had noise problems for many, many years. They actually, speaking of small airlines, and I believe it is, it's either Breeze or Avello, and I get the two confused, these startup small airlines. One of those airlines is flying nonstops from White Plains to Los Angeles. Nonstop, okay? Five and a half hours in a very tightly confined space, but they're doing it at very low fares, and it means you don't have to go to Newark or Kennedy Airport. Um, they're not allowed to fly farther out of LaGuardia by law, federal law. I think Dallas is the farthest they're allowed to fly. Denver maybe as well, too. But they can't do flights to the West Coast out of LaGuardia. Physically possible, yes, with these new airplanes and their fuel efficiency, but not allowed to by law. And that's to protect the other two airports, Kennedy and uh, and Newark. Did Jim type anything in the box? Did he? Jim, drop a, drop a dime, drop me an email if you have any other questions and stuff as well, too. And, and I would encourage your uh, readers, uh, viewers, listeners, participants on the Zoom call, Follow up if you have any other questions. I'm happy to answer questions and and uh, send you in the direction of more information if you're interested in something in particular. So, I, Andrea, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for hosting me this evening, and uh, thank you to everybody up in Wilton for and other parts east uh, for joining us this evening as well too for this talk. Thank you so much for all the great information, Jim. You're very welcome. And thank you, everyone. Good night.